Good evening, everybody. We're here at uh, Dagwood's Pub, uh, live on the uh, Wednesday, October the 13th, uh, with Dickie Knowles and uh, Bill Madison sitting in for uh, Carl. Sitting in, sitting in for Carl. You are. That's like pinch hitting for Vapor. It may be. You know, I, I just need big, big shoes to fill, and I don't think I can fill them, but I'll do my best. There you go. I'm sure you'll do well. Thank you. I'm sure you'll do well. We just want to. Uh, Thank Nikki and Eddie uh, here at Dagwoods for uh, allowing us to do this, and uh, you know, we've been doing this for a little while now. Here, uh, coming out every once a month, uh, you guys are awesome coming out as well. Can't hear. Thank you. I said I can't uh, hear you. You can't hear. Everybody else can hear. Um, and uh, so uh, we also like to thank a couple of our other sponsors. We got uh, City Distilling, uh, State Farm, uh, with Philip Young. Averson and Denenberg, Carl's Cards and Collectibles, here at Dagwoods as well, and uh, Hanrahan's Irish Pub as well. So uh, thanks to all them. And um, so we got Dickie Knowles here today. So uh, let's hear it for Dickie Knowles in the yes. house. <laughs> yes, exactly. So um, what do you think of the playoffs? I know you were a big baseball playoff guy, but you like. I, I love this time of the year. I love the fall, but I love to sit around and watch the playoffs. And uh, it'd be nice if the Phillies were in the playoffs. But uh, yes, it was. It's hard to believe the Marlins got in the playoffs last year, and we did. I was trying to figure out who the Braves played last year. But you're not going to like this, but I'm pulling for the Braves because they stole all of our good baseball people. Yeah, Might as well pull for somebody in your own division to win it. But right now, watching the playoffs, I just don't want the Giants to win. Yes. No, exactly. Exactly. I'm, I'm not a uh, key capital fan myself, so uh, that's one person we don't want to see. It's some pretty good games, though. Oh, no, they've been awesome. You know, it's, it's been uh, very, very good, uh, fun, funny games. Uh, it's going to be nice tomorrow, game five. The Dodgers, and the Giants. Dodgers, Dodgers, let's go Dodgers. I yes. can't believe I'm pulling for the Dodgers. <laughs> Dodgers. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, it's crazy how uh, baseball is going these days, but uh, what, what do you think of the way the pitchers are being used these days, with, uh, especially in the playoffs? Bill, it's awful. I mean, uh, Capper went out to the woods out the other day. It's like, why? You know, it's a zero, 0 game. So you don't want him to he get up two singles, but he almost out of both. But you're talking about major league pitching. you got to come see our minor league games. Yes. I spent the last two weeks watching uh, Lehigh Valley. And uh, both clubs, no matter who you're playing, it's ball one, ball two, ball three. If you get all in two, you're guaranteed to go to three and two. This new age way of pitching is really insane. Uh, hitting ain't much better. No, it's not. I don't know if you've seen the numbers, but we led the world in walks. Uh, any, any kids in there tonight? Any kids? Yeah, there's a few. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question. Anybody ever heard of driveline? Thank God. Okay. <laughs> That's what's taking this what's hijacked baseball is drive line. And their whole philosophy is throw it hard as you can, get the spin, don't worry about throwing strikes. You throw it hard as you can long enough, you'll get them out. And aren't they a golf program? That's where they started off, I believe. No, drive lines, uh Kyle Bodie started. They may have started that way. Right, started as a Oh, did they? Yeah. But I, all I know is they're in Seattle. We spent a lot of money sending all of our players out there. And most of the players that went out there. I don't believe there were top prospects, but there was a couple. Uh, they, they can improve velocity. I want to see the longevity of it, but they give up command. Right. Uh, that's my view of it. Uh, not a big drive line. Yeah, no, I agree. I hope I don't get fired tonight for saying that. Since drive line runs a lot of our stuff, but I'm just not being on it. I think you can voice your opinion against it, but it's boring baseball. Yeah. He's got all the walks. Everybody trying to hit a homer or strike it out. Uh, it's hard. To, it's hard to watch baseball and see a triple or double or double plays. Things like that seem to be not as prevalent as they were. Right. Exactly. Let me ask you: If you had one reason why the, the season went wrong, what would you point to? And, and you have to be careful because you're still. I'm not going to be careful. Just I, I, I really struggle with this. Uh, maybe I'm a homer. Maybe I'm such a Phillies fan that. I did not expect the Braves to beat us, but when we played Atlanta for those three games, they were much better than us, and that's when I, I looked at it and I thought, my gosh, they're just better than us. Yes. Uh, they are better than us right now, and 
Larry Cole is a brilliant guy. He's probably one of the best baseball minds I've ever been around. He told me all your long lamb, man. You gotta watch out for lamb. He never said watch out for the Mets. When the Mets were in first place, he kept saying watch out for the lamb. And he was right. The thing that gets me is that when you look at our lineup, they should have hit that. Yes. And uh, Harper's the MVP, in my opinion. I mean, he should win the MVP. Uh, Ria Muto, I thought he was going to have a better year. He played her, banged up. Uh, but when you look at the lineup, the lineup we started with, we never had it on the field. We got it on the field somewhere around July, I believe. It took us that long to get our starting lineup together. And then they didn't score like they, the times they did. But when you play Pittsburgh, who's trying to let you win every game, and then you play uh, Baltimore, you know, people don't realize those are major league clubs. They'll beat you at any time, but you got to play them like it's a World Series. And when we got, when we, Able to play that, not it's hard to win all four games. But when we did well against them and came back and won and scored some runs, I thought, okay, we go in Atlanta, we went two of these games, we're going to play. And we went in Atlanta and we were pitched a great ball game, first ball game. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. They, they, they had the depth, you know, the depth showed up, and, and then they also went out and got you know four outfielders, uh, a couple of bats, and then another bullpen piece. Uh, they're fun to watch. Yeah. They are fun. They're, they're, I mean, anytime you got Freddie Freeman in, in a lineup, it's going to be fun to watch. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's, 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 it's you know, unfortunately, we get to watch that for a while. You know, yeah, that's, that's, that's You know, especially with, with how young Kuna and, and uh, Alvies is. Uh, Riley, you know, Riley came up with the you know, he, He's a guy that, you know, could be a uh, MVP as well. You know what he did this year. It's gonna, he's going to get a lot of votes, but I think it's Bryce. Uh, oh, yeah, no, I, I agree. I think, you know, really the one guy that I on that club that I think deserves a lot of MVP votes. He's two twenty votes here, three two ninety nine, I think. Right. And I think he he needs some votes. Yeah, yeah, and he was winner last year. Yeah, you know, and, you know, so he's definitely uh, there, but yeah, you know, when you look at the whole infield, the whole infield had 25, 30 runs for the whole infield, shortstop, that's eight, that's 26. Right. You know, that, that tells you, you know, how far we are apart from, you know, Ronald Reyes had an awesome year this year. But, you know, you're not going to win a world championship with him playing every day, though. That's the thing that we got ourselves into. He was playing a lot. Yes. And uh, I personally would have loved to see Paul play in and get that experience, and uh, I, I think Ball may be a left fielder. That's my opinion. Maybe he's going to be a left fielder because you know he's going to hit. We need a left fielder, center fielder, shortstop, third base. Yes, we do. Is that it? <laughs> you you the the pitching, a little more pitching. Uh, can I say something about our bullpen? I really thought our bullpen was going to be better. Yes, uh, you know, Naris, Naris, I enjoy Naris while you can. Hopefully, he's still here. But Maris is a he's a horse. He is. He's gonna take the ball all the time. I met that kid in double A. Well, I didn't meet him, I knew who he was. One day I'm sitting in the bullpen in double A. They hit one of our guys. He didn't speak any English. He's sitting there, nobody's talking. I'm in uniform, I have all dressed for those guys. And I'm looking at him and I'd like you I like the way he pitched. I thought he had a lot of I, I thought he had a lot of heart. So he goes in that game. I was I said, Let's see what this kid's made of now. First pitch, bam, right in the back. I go, I like this guy. Uh, and he's been doing that ever since he came up. He protects our players. He's he can be off. We know that. But maybe we need a bona fide closer because when you got Naris leading to him, that's pretty good. And I think some of the other guys, I mean Connor Brock Connor Brockton is gonna be a great pitcher. Oh, yeah. And uh, you know, we took the other kid and put him in a rotation, which I've been saying for many years, that this kid's gonna be a major league starter. And so he did a good we, we, I, I, I don't know why we got the left hander going to San Francisco, but that would have been a good yeah. left hander to keep. We need a left hander. We got a couple guys, but maybe they signed a couple guys in the bullpen. And, uh, you know, our start rotation could be good. Oh, I agree. Yeah, I agree. We, we need a bunch. Um, you mentioned about Bowman. Do you think he can, he can really do that? He seems to me like he uh, is, afraid, is afraid to strike out and, and, and he's trying to be a slapper. Where he's a six foot five. He's a six foot five guy and he's gonna to have to learn to hit for power. He's a six foot five guy that didn't show us a lot of power in the bottom leagues, in my opinion. He hit the ball the other way. Right. He's a unique guy that can be a doubles guy. Chase Sutley was a doubles guy mm-hmm. and he ended up getting a lot of home runs. Yeah. Uh, this ballpark could do that. This ballpark could do that, yeah. 
it's funny, they used to look at Metro Stadium before we moved over to our ballpark, and they were all, all the guys would tell me all the time, Dickie, you played in the vet? I go, yeah, it's a launching pad. Launching pad, it's a big ballpark. You know, this ballpark was the smallest ballpark. You guys, you know, they talk about that, you know, players are bigger, faster, stronger than they. Well, they thought the vet was a big ballpark. They're not bigger, faster, stronger, because all the guys I played with could just spit it out of that ballpark. Can you imagine Smitty and Bull? Cool. Yeah. Some of the guys in that era, like Keeneland and Starkville, hitting it since the Park. Cool. Oh, yeah. No, yeah. Great race pulling out in center field. You know, but I think Bull would have been out. out of the whole stadium. Right. I think he would have been out of Liberty Bell. Yeah. I definitely agree with that as well. Um, you know, I just got a text from Carl. He wants to know if Bubba has been our new sponsor, right? Does this mean I should be drinking the vodka instead? Oh, so City Vodka is our sponsor. All right, so you got to help me with this. You got to let me know these things. You got City Vodka with Lemony. All right. Let me ask questions. So. Anyway. But uh, so um, going back to the, the playoff thing, when, when these pitchers come in four or five innings to start, it, what do you think the problem is that Dallas community came out before they didn't really take them out? You know, when Dallas took over in 1980, uh, I used to ask Dallas this, I'd ride a ready with him, I'd go, when you asked Carlton to run, you said everybody's going to run, you took over in 79, and Carlton goes, I don't run. How did you how did you get around uh, and you didn't tell us the rest of us you're running us to death? And he said, Well, I got up one morning, Carlton said, You better get up early. It better be about 3 a.m. That's what time I'll work out. And Dallas said, I'll be there. And he said, Why don't you do it with me? And he did Gus Hoffman stuff, his karate stuff. And after about 15 minutes, Dallas says, I can't do any of this, but I'm gonna watch you. After about two hours left me working out, he said, First of all, if anybody can do that, they don't have to run. And uh, Lefty was a tremendous, uh, you know, some people call him the greatest left-handed pitcher in the history of baseball, uh, you know, for the longevity and everything. Uh, my, one of my favorite stories of Lefty is when he went out to the mound, we just assumed he's going to go nine innings because he went nine innings every time. Or maybe eight and a third, McGrain tug in, maybe eight and two-thirds. At worst, eight. So we're playing in Wrigley Field, and Carlton's warming up the pitch. And that year, he's 25 and seven, I believe. So he's warming up the pitch, and he's he's on he's on a 10 game run where nobody he got beat like one to nothing, two to one. Otherwise, he's dominating, striking out 10 to 15. You know, making it look easy. So Tug had asked us to go out the night before. That's when I used to drink, and we didn't quite make it in to the uh, to the to the hotel on time, or maybe we didn't make it in. But anyway. So we go to the ballpark and we get there early and not feeling real well. And I realized then that uh, maybe hanging around with Tug McGraw, a veteran, I might I might want to think twice about how long I stay out because I was hurt. So we go into the ballpark, team goes out to play, Carlton's pitching. We're in there saying, hey, we all can just kind of kick back and rest a little bit. Lefty's pitching. He got knocked out the first inning. We come running down to the dugout and Dallas is looking at us. And he finally looked at us and said, boys, I don't, I don't blame you. Better get somebody warmed up. I've already called down there twice. No, you're not down there. So we ran down there and then by the second inning, he knocked him out. That's the only time that I remember him not almost winning every game he pitched in 1980 or being in, in, a, in a position late in the ball game where we had a chance to win. Wow. Yeah. Can you pitch like that today? I think anybody can use a picture like that. That's a good segue in 1980. Why don't you go ahead and take it from there? It is. So, um, another uh, short experience. You, uh, the relief pitcher for game four of the World Series. You weren't, I guess you weren't expecting uh, to come in in the first inning and down four nothing. No, but you want to hear me? You know, you, you, have you ever talked to Kevin Sauche? I know you've met him. You ever met Kevin? No. Nope, Kevin Sauche is a treat. And we're down in the bullpen before the game. He's out there, you know, he. He can barely walk and chew gum at the same time. Sauce is, a, Sauce is one of my best friends, and he had a great arm. So we're down there. We're both mad. We ain't pitched the World Series yet. Right. So we're down there, and next thing you know, Sauce is going, if Dallas doesn't get us in this game soon, I'm going to be really mad. He says, I don't know. What is he scared of? So he's talking, and I said, well, I don't know. Why don't you go tell him? So we're, we're both down there thinking, man, we got to get in the World Series. Our families are watching the game. So uh, – LC comes down to warm up. You know, our relievers would go down when the starter warmed up. It's just a proper thing to do. Now we're down there, and LC's warming up, and Sauce looked at me and he said, 
this might be the day. Because <laughs> Elsie didn't seem to be, you know, throwing very well. And I, I didn't realize his father was ill. And I think his father passed. And his father was dealing with a lot of stuff. And Elsie was dealing with a lot of stuff. And so we're down the bullpen. And bam, bam, Elsie, you know, he gives up the, uh, you know, base hit, walk, throws the ball away is what he did on Willie Wilson. Then a base hit, a triple, a home run, a double. It's just everything's happening. Balls are getting out of the park. So they called down and said, get Knowles up. So I got up. Then they said, get Sauche up. So I'm up throwing, and I probably throw about eight pitches. And Sauce goes, they call rain again. And Irish Mike Ryan says, you ready? I said, yeah, I'm ready. Sauce said, you can't be ready. I said, this is our chance to pitch in the World Series. Sauce goes, he's ready. You know, because he knows if I get in, he's coming in. So when I went in that game with the bases loaded, the funny thing about it was I went 3-0 and on the first hitter. It was Willie Wilson, I believe, or I had walked the first hitter. No, I think I walked the first hitter I faced, struck out the next hitter. And then uh, uh, I walked the first hitter on four pitches, struck out the next hitter on three pitches. See, I still do have a memory in my old age. And then Willie Wilson came up. I went three and I with bases loaded. And uh, I threw a strike, and the next pitch I threw would have been ball four, but he grounded out. And Pete Rose fielded the ball, and he was hollering when I hit it, get over here, Pie. And I realized, you know, I'm going to get over there pretty quick, and I barely beat Willie to the back. So on the way out, and we're going back to the dugout, I slammed the ball down like Pete. And uh, so we went back, we were going across the field, and I hear him in the dugout talking about Willie Wilson. You know, he, 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 he guys, these guys are running on us. They're, they're, they're trying to intimidate us. It's two games to one now. Willie Wilson, I mean Willie Wilson, Willie Mays Aikens hit the home run. He stood at home plate. He watched it. So I heard the chatter. So I go out for the next inning, second inning. They're already batted around. So Willie Willie hits a home run off me. And it was a 3-1 breaking ball. And he hit it so far. I wasn't a pitcher that really watched the hitter when he hit a home run. I watched the ball. So I turned around. He hit it far enough. So I turned around. I watched it. It was a long one. So Pete was at first base. And when Pete started hollering, hey, Willie, you better run. I knew something was up then, so I knew I was going to have to do something later in the game. But I didn't think I was going to come in the first inning, but I was glad to come in that first inning. Yeah, well, you went four and two thirds. You know, so you nobody know knows I struck out quite a few guys in that game. Yeah. I, I got mad at Dallas for taking me out. I said, Dallas, right now they're showing me they can't touch me. You're taking me out. I'm going to get ten or twelve strikeouts. Come on, let me stay in. So, so Dallas started being a <laughs> No, <laughs> I, I, where's Dallas? Do you didn't hear? Yeah, you didn't hear that. <laughs> No, you definitely won't. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it's it's crazy. You know, but you know, you four thirds. Uh, like she wants to show you the. Uh, he came in. Uh, I think Brew came in after me or Sauce. You know, uh, during the ball game, you know, the famous pitch or the infamous pitch. They pitch. You know, I got people that always tease me. I'm looking at it right now. They go, uh, one year in, in 1987, I didn't have a job. I called Dallas Green up in Chicago. And I said, Dallas, I said, how you doing? He said, great. I said, uh, said you, everything good? I said, uh, he says, yeah, I was a grandmother. I said, good. He says, uh, well, I can't take you out here, by. I have too many players. Your agent's trying to get me to sign Dick Moss now. I said, Dallas, you got the World Series ring on? He said, how you threw one day pitch? So that one pitch has done a lot for me, especially in Philadelphia. I guess still do card shows off of one pitch. But, you know, as I was telling you in the second inning, when Aikens hit the home run off me, he hit it so far. Rose was hollering at Willie. He said, Willie, you better run. Then he, I heard him hollering at Willie, so I turned around. And Willie was in the batter's box, so I told Willie Mays Aikens, I said, you better run. And he still didn't run. He started walking. I said, I'm going to hit you right in the head. We say those things on the field, believe it or not. The umpires here, they don't. Nowadays, the umpires get all messed up. But, so when I told him that, I don't think he could hear me. They were so loud. So when I, I got through that inning, and then I – Got through the next inning. I was pitching really good. I sat on the bench, and Tug was there. Marty Bison was there, and I sat between them. And Tug goes, hey, Pi, because that's my nickname. He goes, get me that. He goes, hey, Pi, he says, I think you ought to, I think you got to let somebody know out there. You know, you got to move somebody. So Marty, hard Marty just said, you need to drill somebody. I go, hey, guys, I want to pitch in the World Series. And Tug goes, that's what you're doing, but you need to. I said, I'll do something. Just give me time. And then Tug goes, you got to show me. I'm from Missouri. I go, cute. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm saying, these guys are all over me. I, I, so I went out to the mound in the fourth inning to nail somebody. And that somebody was Willie Mays Aikens. Unfortunately, Brett, I threw a fastball by Brett. 
who started messing around with Smitty. Remember the fake bunt? Mm. He, they're talking. I'm looking at him. Like I said, hey, you better get in the box. I threw another fastball by him, and that was the year he hit 390 and took Gossage's best fastball on the upper deck. So I, I, I told him, I, I said, get, you better get back in the box. You leave my third base for a long. I don't think they could hear it. So he got back in the box, and I wound up. I said, I'm knocking this guy down. We, we came up with an era where they talked to you. If you didn't want to hit him, throw it right here. It's wrong now, but that's where we grew up there. So I was going to hit Willie Mays Aikens in the meantime. I said, I'm not Brett down. So realistically, I threw the pitch exactly where I want to. I'm not proud of that. Can you imagine if I would have hit him? I'd have been the biggest villain in baseball. But I loved him when he went down. The whole stadium went quiet. And Fry ran out. And the next thing you know, Pete's by walking up outside me. And Jim Fry is looking at me. Their whole dugout's hollering some of the most pleasant things they ever heard in my life. I mean, they're hollering at me from the dugout, and Rose is standing there like the referee. So then, then, then Brett spun around and somehow was looking at me this way with anger, like he wanted to kill me. So Fry's hollering, stop it right now, stop it right now, go out there and tell him. And then Pete's standing right here, and I kind of look down, and I was, you know, I'm looking at Fry. I don't care about Fry, and he's an old man, but I'm looking at Brett. If he gets something comes out, I got to be ready. So I, I see Pete heading that way, and Pete goes, he wasn't throwing at him. And Fry goes, how do you know? He goes, because he's throwing at him, and he hit him. And then uh, Fry didn't know what to say. He kind of looked at him. Now they're going at it. And then Rose looked in their dugout and says, pitch your own game. He said, if you want to hit any more of him, go right ahead. They all sit down. So that pitch was more Pete Rose than me, realistically. I think he took that pitch made it into something larger than it was. And I think he he used that pitch to intimidate him. And nobody came to my age but him. And by, by being there, Bill, he, he basically said, we threw the pitch. Do something. And yeah. after that, I don't know if it really – I've heard it changed the World Series. I don't believe that. I was just going to say it's the same. At 65 years old now, I like to hear it, but I, I really don't believe that. I think that that pitch did – those guys are too good as ball players, too good as athletes. They're not going to let one pitch intimidate them. No, but he only had what three hits after that? Two, two, I mean, maybe three. Yeah, it's three. still something for your own to be motivated by. You know, they right. see you do that, and all of a sudden they want to they want to find a way to get behind you and make it work even better. Speaking of this whole situation, why don't we do a trivia question? I was just going to suggest that. Just, just so see, great minds do think alike occasionally. Uh, did you pay attention? What game of the 1980 World Series did Dickie Knowles knock down George Brett? We have a hand up right yeah, here. Yeah, that coming over for you. Team four. Very Team good. Team four was correct. Very good. Give her a prize. Yeah, she's going to get one of our city vodka uh, sips up, up here. Wait, she's Okay, <laughs> just to make sure. All right. So, if not, then I get it, right? There you go. Okay. That's the rules. All right. That's the rules. So, uh, so Tyler, you can answer. <laughs> um, so um, are you getting back to the analytics a little bit there? Uh, do you think the analytics are uh, ruining players and pitchers as far as uh, not giving them the confidence of uh, can't get that second or third time through the line and off and you know, I played golf today and my fingers about broke and I picked up a 75 pound bag of semen and I was moving it and it fell on my finger. I was like, no, because I'm playing golf. The reason I'm telling you that is about a week, eh, a little longer than that, I had two 75 pound bags of semen that have been rained on and they're very hard. And I went to the corner of my yard, which is probably 50 yards. And I seen the guy had left them up there because he put a fence in for me. So I picked these things up, 75 and 75. I put one on my bird thing, and I put the other one up. And I walked it all the way to the corner where my neighbor wanted it, and I dropped them because I thought they were 50 pounds. And they were 75. And when I dropped them, he got them, and he, but of course he left them behind my shed. He ain't got them yet, that's why I dropped it again. And, and the reason I tell you that is because I'm incapable of carrying those 75 pounds. That's 150 pounds. Right. And so yesterday I hurt my finger because I couldn't pick up one because now I knew. Man. The whole time I was carrying them, I thought they were 50s. Exactly. My son came over and goes, you pick these up? I go, yeah. So I think mentally your brain can be full of a lot of things. 
I'm telling you, on my mother's grave, I tried to pick up one of them up. I picked two of them up, and I cannot pick one of them up and carry it right now. So your brain is a powerful thing. So we were just talking about that, and my son's like, how did you pick those up? So he had to show me to pick both up and like to kill them. But I think that's what analytics does to a lot of people's brains. I think some people get addicted to it. They feel like, now listen, there's a lot of good to analytics when used appropriately. And there's a lot of stuff I wish I had. But once that game starts, play the game of baseball. The game of baseball deserves to be played the way it used to be played. You know, the game starts, it's me and you, 60 feet, the greatest battle in all the sports, 60 foot, six inch battle. Me and the hitter, the hitter and me. I'd like to see it go back to that. I know, you know, I, I, I'll tell you a funny story. My first major league game, Pete Rose is so hilarious. Pete Rose, I, I, I got called up on July the 4th, stayed at the Hilton, and uh, Paul Owens told me not to unpack, and, and I could unpack my suitcase and put it in the uh, put it in the drawers in there because I said I'm staying. So I'm walking across the field, and I'm totally intimidated when I walk in that clubhouse. Like I see Pete Rose, I see Mike Smith, the White Sox. You got to win a game first. So I go out and pitch my first game. I lost against the New York Mets. But that, when the guy I face, the first guy I face is Joel Youngblood, and we're in the room going over every hitter, much much like analytics. Analytics is just more science. We did all this stuff. Just they got more science, more on iPads. Guy stands behind you on an iPad, interrupts you, and tells you what's going on. Well, we already do that. So I'm, I'm getting ready to face Joel Youngblood, first hitter in the big leagues. We spent 20 minutes talking about all these hitters, and I think 16 of them on Joel Youngblood. Don't throw him fastballs. He can hit a breaking ball, but he can kill a fastball. So Bob Boone puts down fastball for the first pitch of the game. I threw a fastball right by him, strike one. Then Bob Boone came back and put down slider. I went, no. Oh. And he goes, slider. I went, no. So he said, that guy, come on, kid. You first day of the big leagues. Threw another one right by him. Bob Boone put down slider, slider, slider. No, no, no. I want to strike out my first guy with a fastball. So I threw a fastball in, ball one. He put down slider. I went, no. So I threw a fastball, boom, home run. First guy facing the big leagues, hit a home run. He's running around, faces up, going, oh. So the game's over, and I got beat three to two. I left winning two to one. Game's over. And Rose is in the clubhouse. He goes, hey, uh, Dickie. I go, yes, sir. He goes, uh, where'd you graduate from college? I go, I didn't go to college. He goes, hey, Booty, didn't you graduate from Stanford? He looked at me at the end. I went, I got you, Pete. You know, don't shake him off. But So we use somewhat of analytics, but... I think we make mistakes in analytics like we did in the old days. You know, I should have thrown a slider. I knew that. I was hard-headed. But I think today they don't allow you to make your own choices sometimes. That guy in that dugout is looking at the iPad going, this is how you're going to pitch it. You know, they take the hat off and they look at that and put it back on. I still don't know what that is when they take the hat off. Is that a runner and second sort of thing, what side it is, or is that a, I got to throw this by fast balls up, breaking balls down. That's my big beef with it. One good thing has come out of it is the fastball one. Oh, yeah. You know, they act like nobody ever did that. My first time I faced Willie McCovey, I remember being in my backyard as a kid acting like Willie Mays, Willie McCovey. First time I faced Willie McCovey, my book goes fastball up, and he kind of held the glove up. We didn't throw it to glove, we threw above the glove. That's why I struck Willie McCovey out three times that night on nine fastballs, and they all were the same place they throw them now. It's just that hitters back then, unless Willie was older mm. in 1979. But most of the hitters back then knew how to stay off of it or get on top of it with two strikes. And if you get one right here and they get on top of it, it goes a long way. But now, with baseball, people swing it up. So you throw it up there, they're not going to hit it. So the analytics are helping the analytic type of player. There you go. Is there one guy? Well, I like it now. No. Is, is there one guy who throughout your entire career just gave you fits? Is there one guy, a hitter, that did that other than Joel Rumble? Joel Youngblood never hit me after that. <laughs> Did you never threw him? I made sure I struck him out on all sliders. Uh, a lot of left-handers gave me trouble. You know, I, I, I Smitty said he don't run off of me. Michael did, but I got Smitty out all the time. I remember I had to go back and look. He did it home run, but the Phillies never beat me. George Brett never hit me very well. Eddie Mur Murray never hit me very well. Rock Grew didn't hit me very well. So I'm proud of that, but every other left-hander wore me out. But the hitter that gave me the most trouble is Harold Baines, okay. um, Wade Boggs, by the numbers. Those guys just, I two, could, I, I didn't get them out. Two pretty good hitters. Yeah. Tony Wayne, forget about him. Well, that's another club that, I mean, those guys probably wore out quite a few. So I, I okay, would you were doing that. 
Yeah. Okay, okay. It's when Joe Youngblood hits your feet. That's when you're. Yeah. No offense to Joe. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so, um, what, what was it like playing in the uh, IP and LCS? As a player, greatest uh, championship you know. series ever. ever. Right. Uh, I mean, once we finished that championship and we went to the World Series, it was almost like we had to pick ourselves back up. I mean, this is, Philadelphia never won a World Series before. We had to win a World Series. And uh, I don't want to answer this question backward. I'm, I'm writing a book called Living Life Backwards, so I'm going to do this backwards. When we won the World Series, and that sixth game, and I'm down in the bullpen, and I'm throwing, I'm the only guy throwing in case Tom gives up a grand slam. And I got to go in the game. And after a while, you know, I got right by the right by the plexiglass, and, and Mike Ryan said, Dickie, Dallas called, once you up for I said, I'm ready. And they're not taking tug out. He ain't getting hit. We're going to celebrate. I said, I got you. But when I looked around, I seen all these people. I think the official attendance may have been 65,000. There were about 70,000 people there. People started coming in in the seventh. And all the people that lived in that community, a lot of the ushers, a lot of the people lived there, worked there. Families started to come out. People were coming out of woodwork. And my understanding is, and this is not official, but I know what happened, that uh, everybody was letting anybody who wanted to come in come out night then. Because they, that's, that was such a big thing for Philadelphia. It was a special thing. That's when it hit me how special this World Series is going to be for this town. And how special. This is not Pete Rose, Mike Smith, Gary Maddox, Larry Ball, Bate McBride, not Dickie Knowles. Or, this is not our World Championship. This is the whole Philadelphia World Championship. And then after it was over, Dallas went out on the field and came back and was saying that to us. You guys have no idea what you just got for this city. So I was not aware of that, but all the other players were aware of that going into the National League Championship Series. You know, the Ghost 64. I didn't know the Ghost 64. You know, 50, uh, all the way back to 1912. Everybody was like, we've got to win this. There's so much pressure on us. We went game one, they went game two. Everybody knows there was four extra games. Know about the fourth inning of game four, how crazy that was. So we get to game five. And game five was probably the greatest baseball game I've ever been involved in as far as if I'm sitting right beside you and I'm going to talk to you during that game, you can't hear me. I mean, that was the loudest noise I've ever heard in the Houston Astrodome. Back then, they smoked. So the, the upper deck, you can't even see people. It's just full of smoke. And they're hollering, Houston Astros. And, and uh, it is just loud. And as far as that series goes, that's the greatest championship series ever. There was so much excitement. We became, we didn't, we, and this means Pete Rose, Dallas Green, and all of us, we became lowly players that day. Jumping out of the dugout to high five people, jumping out of the dugout to argue. Uh, incredible series, I'll never forget. Yes, in, in that series, what, what, or especially game five, day, what was like the one moment that was like you knew? Well, I didn't come here to talk about Pete Rose all night long, but I really <laughs> definitely got to talk about Pete right here. We, we, when, when, when they put up on that scoreboard after they took a three run lead, five to two, I believe, and Nolan Ryan in the eighth inning, they put up Nolan Ryan's career record, something like 129 to two. You know, I don't really remember the numbers, but it was, it was, it was phenomenal. Went leaking after eight innings. Our whole dugout, I mean, it was, it was quiet in our dugout. Uh, Smitty had his head down, Boa had his head down there, and Rose got in that dugout and said, hey, you guys might have lost in 77, 78, 76. We ain't losing. He didn't say that, but that's what he meant. He goes, hey, let's go. We can beat that guy out there. Not so kind of, but he said, we can beat that guy. And he looked at Boa, who was putting his back helmet on one up there. He said, Boa, if you get on, we'll win this game. Now, all of a sudden, the dugout got real lively and real loud. Get on, Boa, come on. And we forgot that Nolan Ryan was pitching. We forgot what was up there. And Boa, you know, they played Boa again a little bit because he chopped the ball, he beat it out. Hit a little single. And then Boone came up and really hit a double play ball. And Rose was. Rose was like the kid. He said that at the end of the dugout, you can see the video going, Bobby, get on there. We're all hollering, Booty, get on there. Let's go. Let's go. We forgot about the score. We know we're going to win this game. And uh, Booty had a perfect double play ball somewhat. Might not have been perfect, you know, as time went on, but he got an infield hit. How about that? Yeah. No one, no one won the best field. First and second. Jared, Greg Rose comes up, and Rose is a cheerleader again. Teach him, get on any way you can. 
and Rose is on deck, and we hear Rose hollering, come on, Gigi, you know, and, and Greg laid down the greatest plot ever. I mean, that plot rolled, and they, and it, you know, Savelle couldn't do anything. We got Mason Sloan in the house. Yep. And now you could, that, we were really fired up in our dugout. And that was the man. The man's got to go up and get And Rose, and I'll tell you what, Rose later on told me those two fastballs he got from Nolan early were unhittable. They had to be 110, he said. Just boom. And he worked a 3 2 count, kept fouling off balls. And, and Nolan missed about that far. Of course, Greg Maddox or Gladwell would have got that. Picture, just about that far. And when he threw ball four, and he flipped that bat back towards our dugout, and Rose ran towards where uh, yeah. yeah. Ryan. Yeah. And, I, and later on, he said, I said, What did you, you tell him? He said, I told him to get a dog. And he said, If you're scared, get a dog. And uh, I don't know if he said that or not, but. I don't know when Ryan got him back during the strike here. He wasn't going to let him break that record and struck him out three times in the bat. But when Rose did that, I think it, I think he just kind of – he inspired everybody. He brought us back to being kids. Hey, man, we're going to win this game. We're, we've been knocked down, but if we have to, we're going to fight you. We're going to win this at, at all costs. We're going to win this game. And then the rest is history. You know, Rose walked five to three. Next thing you know, boom, we're up six to five, and they come back tight. Yeah, exactly. Well, it's that like, moment that he in the dugout, to me personally, let us know that we can't lose. We're not going to lose this game. Yeah. Yeah. Can I trivia time? Go, go for it. All right. That unfortunate day in uh, 1982 when the Phillies decided to trade Mr. Rolf to the Cubs. Oh, uh, my notes are wrong. Well, it was before the 82 season. Ah. December of 81, I'll tell you why in a minute. Technically, right. December. So, who did the Phillies get back for the Eagles? There's a hand in the way back. Wow. Way, way back. back. Who? And we get the Mike Kripka. There you That's go. That's correct. Congratulations to Mike Schmidt. 20 game winner. Mike Schmidt. Schmidt. His name's Mike Schmidt. Schmidt. Yeah. Your name's Mike Schmidt? Yeah. Can you play? Uh, that's why I'm sitting here. <laughs> <laughs> You got trivia. He did. He does. Do you want to do the second? Next one, too? Absolutely. Let's let's uh, sort of the same note. So in 1987, is that correct? Oh, uh, here we go. Dickie <laughs> was traded from the Cubs to the Tigers. You got to understand, I am reading this, and it is a chicken scratch. You'll get this one. So when he was traded from the Cubs to the Tigers, who was he traded for? Right up front here or there? Okay. Right. All right. For himself. For himself. Very good. Very that is good. correct. And how does that happen? Dickie? There's been four of us. I think there's been five. That's four. Yeah. Four. four. Yeah. Um, Dallas is gone, so I can say this. The commissioner can't punish him. I knew I was traded that day for myself, and I wasn't supposed to talk about it because I got so mad at him. Prior to that year, when I told you earlier, I called Dallas Green up, and I told, I told him I needed a job. And he said, hey, you threw one pitch. After that, he told me, I can't tell you not getting that 280 Dodson years, which I had a Corvette that didn't have a Dodson and 65 Corvette. He said, and drive that 280 Dodson out to Arizona. I won't have a room for you, but you better be in good shape to pitch to it. So I went out there and I made that team. When we made a deal that year, he messed me up. He gave me hardly no money. And I nearly got released that year, but I had my best year in the big leagues. And at the end of that season, we were traveling to uh, St. Louis. He got on the bus and he said, you've know, had a one-year contract your whole career, right, Pi? I said, yeah. He said, you'll get a two-year. I said, really? He goes, you really impressed me. I need you back to get a two-year contract. And he said, I'm gonna, I am gonna. I got some news for you. I'm going to name Book Manager. I said, ah, the world's great. Book's going to become manager. I'm going to get a two-year deal. Can't get much better. Dallas resigned because it wouldn't let him name Book as manager. And... Uh, so I didn't get my two-year deal. But on September 22nd, 1987, I'm in the bullpen in Chicago. They called my name to get up in the bullpen, and they traded me. And I looked up at him, and I point my fingers. I come off the field. John Vukovic is like, come on, i got to get off the field. So I don't trade. I go in the clubhouse. There's an unwritten law, unwritten rule. If you don't shower, then you're in big trouble in the major league clubhouse. My league, too. You're going to be in big trouble. They're going to find you. All the players going to get on you. So out of nowhere, they're telling me, don't shower, just use your clothes on, you got to go, you're going to Detroit. I'm going to Detroit? No, you're going to Fenway, but Detroit's playing there, you just got traded. 
Could you take it? Could you change? Dallas wants to see you. I'm changing clothes, not showering. My roommate was great now. So I go up there. Dallas is waiting. We got to get you to the airport. I trade you. I said, Why'd you trade me? He goes, I said, Dallas, you've made it. I'm all over it. And he goes, Listen, get your butt to the airport. You're not done here yet. So I knew. I looked at him and he goes, Just get out of here. So I get to I get to Boston. I come in in the ninth inning of the ball game. First of all, I go into Boston. Detroit is cheap. Detroit gave me a uniform with one button up here, one button down here, and no zipper. My fly wasn't working. So I said, I'm not pitching. I don't have a name on my back either. So I go to the bullpen. We get to the ninth inning. I just left Wrigley Field with the bases loaded. I didn't get in that game. Now I'm in Fenway Park with the bases loaded. I go, this is a fantasy camp three. Who played in both parks in one day? I nearly did. So they you get those up. Ninth inning, we're in a pennant race, eight to five game, bases loaded, two outs. Willie Hernandez, one side yard, he's throwing. They come out to the mound, they go, Dickie, you're in. And I was like, No, no, Willie, you're in. He goes, No, Dickie. I said, I'm in. I said, okay. So I ran in a ball game. I got on the mound. I took my warm-up tosses. Remember Ken Kaiser, the big Big umpire? Yeah. He's the umpire. He goes, would you button your shirt? I go, I only have two buttons. He goes, oh, would you zip your fly up? I go, I don't have one. He goes, get the hitter out. So I threw one pitch, grabbed ball back to me, got a save. And so I went back to, we didn't have a lot of um, media stuff then, you know. So I went back to the room. I'm in the room watching the sports. It comes on TV. We all did that. And they were going, yeah, the Tigers beat our Red Sox tonight, and he says the guy came in and got the save. Dickie Knowles was traded during the middle of the game, and um, so I'm listening to that. And I thought, man, that's pretty cool. You know, I mean, I, I, and that's the first time they hit me. I said, okay, I had a chance to pitch in both ballparks. I didn't know I was going to be famous for getting traded for myself. <laughs> Only one of four players. One of four. How about uh, any questions from the crowd? Is there anybody out there that has a question? Don't, don't, be don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. All right. Well, back to you, John. All right. <laughs> uh, so, um, what, what were there was a question on questions. Facebook. Um, they want to know if you played any other sport. You know, I didn't play. I played uh, basketball earlier, and I played a little football. But in high school, I only played baseball, so I think that's what people are referring to. But I. I loved all the, I call those the Trinity sports, but now I'm a golfer. But no, I play all sports. I love all sports. I played a lot of sandlot football and basketball. I played sports all through my life. I mean, I would, you know, during basketball season, we played basketball all day. During football season, we played football. And, you know, and, you know, but only one for high school. Any sports you follow these days? I follow all sports, really. I, 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 that's a lie. I followed all sports until recently, and then and I kind of got turned off to some sports. So I watch golf and baseball. Okay. Or our home teams. I do watch the Eagles. I do watch Flyers, and I do watch the Sixers. Outside of that, it's football. I mean, baseball and golf. Okay. John, I got another question. Another question. got another question. Hi. Hi. So speaking of other sports, there is a certain player for another team in Philadelphia right now who. Maybe doesn't love Philadelphia fans. How did you, um, you know, maybe, how did you feel about the Philadelphia fans? You know, we went to an organizational meeting one year, and they said we got to start drafting players that are fit to play in Philadelphia. It takes a special person to play in Philadelphia. I was probably too dumb to realize that. I love the Philly fans. I think the guys in my era did, but we did have a we 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 would battle with the fans, and I think the fans appreciated that. Like. Uh, 1981, we played the Montreal Expos, and we were down two games of one, and Dallas wouldn't announce that I was a starting pitcher. And I was totally upset with it, but I understood it. But the town of Philadelphia are very knowledgeable fans. They're like, if you don't pitch Steve Crawford, we're going to boo you out, out of the stadium. So they didn't pitch Steve Crawford, and I started the game. So I'm in the bullpen warming up, and, and I didn't realize that I walk out, as soon as I came out of that plexiglass door, walk out towards home plate, because in the playoffs, Philly fans don't wait to get to the game. They're not like the Dodgers. They're there early, 65,000 of them. They're there. So I walk out, and I hear the loudest boos I've ever heard before, and I was mad. I'm looking around like, heck with y'all. Of course, I was a little more, uh, I didn't say it that politely. So I went into the game, 
And I struck out the side the first inning. I walked off the field, and I'm looking at them like, there you go. And so I got in the dugout, Pete Rose goes, they wasn't booing you. They're booing Dallas. But I, I'm going I'm to send somebody up there and tell them to start booing you if you're going to pitch like that. But I think they can motivate you when they boo you. And the guys that I played with, Bo and all those guys would fight back with the fans. I think if you look at the history of the guys that would fight back with the fans and would say the same sort of fans, they all played better after that. And they got Jimmy Rollins. He called the fans out. The fans got on him. I don't know if you remember that, but they got on him. And Jimmy went four for five that night with a triple and a homer. And then they let out the loudest cheers I've ever heard in that Citizens Bank ballpark. That's the Philly fan. They're going to let you know when you're doing good. And they let you know when you're not doing good because they're probably the most knowledgeable baseball fans. New York, forget it. Philly fans are much more knowledgeable. Boston, I know you got great fans, forget it. Philly fans will cheer when Brett Myers is hitting and making the pitcher throw 13 pitches to him, and then he gives up a grand slam to the next hitter. They get that. So I think people, uh, I think the Philadelphia fans most knowledgeable, most uh, uh, enthusiastic uh, fan in all the sports. There's some great fans. Cup fans are great fans. But people have asked me this when I played in Texas, when I played in other ballparks. Philly fans are the best. Exactly. You're reading my notes. <laughs> well, can I say one more thing to that? How many times have you ever heard someone leave Philadelphia and not say Philly fans are the best? They all say. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, the World Series is great. What, what were some of your uh, experiences there? And what would you remember that most about it? I'm going to have to be honest about this. There's really no young people in here, right? No. Well, I'm going to be honest about this. I've been I've been sober longer than I've been drunk. I've been sober for 38 years. But uh, unfortunately, that that parade, I don't remember much about it. I, I, I don't like myself for that. I was warned by a couple of players. I think you don't, you don't go out too much tonight and stay out all night because and, and guys would say, you're going to see a parade you've never seen before. So the next day, if you look at the parade, you can see there's one drunk guy on there that ain't doing much but setting back, and that was me. Uh, I'm the one that started fans throwing the beers into the back of the uh, floats. And, uh, uh, but it was a Woodstock parade. It was an unbelievable parade. I remember jumping off of the floats with Tug going over to use the bathroom, and people making a wall around us so nobody could see us. It was crazy. And uh, I remember... Uh, uh, I remember a lot of it until we got to JFK, which was 100,000 people there. By then, I was not feeling very well. If I had it all in order, yeah, I wouldn't have had one drink. Just understanding the magnitude of that parade. I, I, was in, I was on both parades. There's only been four or five of us that were on both parades. The 08 parade and the 80 parade. Right. Pretty cool. Yeah. But I will say this. Everybody says the 08 parade was better. No chance. That 80 parade was a lot better. And I don't know why they say that, but... When you finish up a parade in front of a hundred and some thousand people, that's pretty, pretty crazy. Mm. Yeah, sure. Um, so, um, what makes Philadelphia home for you? Since you, you were born here. Well, I was born in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I came up to Philadelphia in '79 and played. And I said I'll never live in this town, and uh, and I'm in it. And so I went all the way back to Charlotte, and then. Uh, I end up marrying somebody from this area, and I really got to know the area. The only one thing, people say you make a lot of mistakes in your life. I made a lot of mistakes in my life, but um, one of the biggest mistakes I ever made was not understanding this area. Uh, and I make my home here now for, for 30 years. I don't plan on leaving. It's a great area. Um, I, I'll give you an example. Lottie Smith is from Compton, California. And, Lonnie, I said, let's go get a cheesesteak one night. And Lonnie was so afraid of Philadelphia. It was not funny. I go, you, you live in Compton, California, dude. And he was just kind of like, Philadelphia was fast for me. I mean, I called my brother the other day. This is where area I'm from. Did he watch y'all do up there, Philadelphia? And I'm sitting there thinking, did I talk like that? I did. And he's like, my land of praise kicking y'all the butt. And I said, Donald. You got anything else you want to say tonight? Because if you keep talking like this, it's going to be time to get up. Get to the point. But, uh, you know, it's a slower pace of life down there. You know, a lot of northerners are moving down there, changing Carolina with the bank and stuff. But uh, I came to Philadelphia. It was very fast, very quick for me. Said I'd never live here. I don't know if I'd ever go back to Carolina. Nah, just teasing. But 
I love Philadelphia. I like this whole area up here. I mean, I go to the mountains, go to the beach about the same amount of time, and uh, I, I think I'm uh, I'm I'm set probably to until these don't fire me after the night. Retire here. There you go. Very good. Very good. So, um, who who um, during your playing career, who who was the player or players that that inspired you or gave you the Acknowledged that he I, I think John Vukovic made the biggest impact in my career. He tried and tried, and then when I got sober, I realized how, how important he was. Johnny Oates was another guy that was big in my career. But the guy that I go back to, Pete Rose was too, and you know, Ferguson Jenkins, a lot of these guys. But the guy I go back to is Dallas Green. Uh, I don't think I'd be living today if it wasn't for Dallas Green. Uh, many of you don't know about my past, but I was a little wild. I'm the most boring guy you'll ever meet now, but uh, Dallas probably saved my life, uh, taught me a lot about baseball. Um, I, 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 I've been told, Richie Ashford had the greatest line, people got mad at it, but Ashford watched me pitch one night, said on the air, Dickie Hall is the biggest waste of talent I've ever seen to Harry. And I remember boarding that plane, I mean, uh, 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 plane, yeah, we got on the bus and Richie would come back and play cards with us, and I'm staring at him like, you know, I'm mad because believe it or not, when we play cards, I had to hold Richie's cards sometimes. And uh, so I'm sitting back there. He was in our group. That's the difference in baseball now than then. You don't see the naps are set with the players. Harry, Harry, Harry uh, Callis and Richie played right with us. You know, played cards with us. And, uh, I'm looking at him and he goes, well, Dickie boy, if it wasn't true, I wouldn't say it. <laughs> I said so later on, he explained to me what he meant by that, and, and he was right. And there was a lot of people that were trying to to change that part of my life, and I, I didn't want to do it. Uh, you may not remember this. I was 36, 53 in my, in my career. But when I stood on the mound and threw, uh, and this includes Carlton many times, I felt like my stuff was good as better than anyone's ever threw hard as anybody. So I had pretty good stuff. I just kind of wasted it by the time I ran into some trouble and changed my life. Uh, you know, I lost a lot of that stuff, but the guy that was always there for me and and, and, and and always, no matter what was going on, was there to pick me up or knock me down was Dallas Green. Nice. Before you ask uh, one of your last questions, uh, let's go over a few things that are coming up. Uh, this Saturday at Carl's Cards from 1 to 2.30 is who will be a Eagles Hall of Famer at that point, John Runyon. John Runyon will be there from 1 to 2.30, so... Be sure to come out to Carl's Cards in Havertown. Uh, next Wednesday, we're at Hanrahan's. Well, John's going to be at Hanrahan's. I'll be watching at that point because I'm, I'm a one and done kind of guy. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, who do we have uh, tomorrow or next week? Uh, next week is Brian Prop. Brian Prop. Flyers Brian Prop. Hanrahan's in Drexelville. Yes. And then next month, we're back here. What day? We are back here uh, November 10th. November 10th. We will be having uh, Mitch Williams. Mitch, the wild thing. Mitch Williams will be here on November 10th. That's a Wednesday. And then the week after that, we're back to hand hands again. And it is. Now we're we're that. That's a top secret. Oh, it's, uh, I just told him. No, you didn't say I, didn't said, I did, but I said it on the okay. Oh, okay. All right, good. Hopefully, I caught it. All right. But. Uh, all right. Anybody else in the room have any more questions? Oh, I see one in the back. There we go. Crowd participation is always wonderful. You're the smartest guy in pitching. Yeah, Dex, uh, I, I know you're saying you're a golfer. Uh, we had Mickey Moore and Dickie here last month. And we understand he is an ambassador for the Phillies, doing a lot of golf tournaments. Are you involved with that? And are you better than Mickey? I played with Mickey today, and we tied. We played a two-man scramble. But, uh, no, Mickey's an ambassador. you got to have a better back of the baseball card than mine to be an ambassador. So he's an all-star. But, Mickey, we, we live near each other. We play golf together a lot, and I'm not an ambassador. I'm an employee assistant professional, which I think uh, I, I caused so many problems in my career. The good Lord allowed me to, to, to take this job, and it's, it's sometimes it's a nightmare. But my job is to help major and minor league players with any job performance-related problem or issues, marriage problem. I'm not a counselor, uh, but I refer and assess most problems. I can do short-term counseling. I've been doing this for, I've been with when I started. And uh, David Montgomery wanted a, 
like you know, like in the old days, if you're not familiar with EAP, it's employee assistant professional. It's a job um, related performance issue. Like it's it's a counseling. Uh, it's it's for it's confidential program for players and their families is what I do. So Dupont, Coca Cola, way back, and uh, they started them. Uh, of course, David being in Philadelphia, understanding that. Uh, his dream was to have a baseball player to do that. And I remember like yesterday when he asked me to do it, I turned around and looked and said, so you're talking to me? You want me to be an EAP? So I've been doing it for 26, 27 years, 30, 30 years with the Phillies. And uh, it's, a, it's, it's an interesting role to have, especially after the pandemic. There's a lot of issues out there. Thank you. Yes, very nice. Very good. Like that, mm -hmm. yeah, very good. Um, so a little bit about that with the um, is, is there not enough uh team bonding uh after games <laughs> like, like you guys used to do with players today? And, and does that like hurt teams not become a good team? I had this conversation sitting in my swing. I got a swing, I call it my therapy swing. I go out and get away from everybody, I'm looking at my pool and I can swing. And, eat, drink my coffee and figure out, you know, how to solve all the problems of the world sometimes. And I was talking to a major league player the other night and this came from his voice. You know, he goes, how was it when you play? And I said, what do you mean? He goes, in our clubhouse, we don't have a clubhouse. We hear all the stories of the 93 team, John Crook. And I was, I was around, that was my first year of being in a clubhouse, 93. And I knew all those players. And that, that was a, that was my funnest, and that the 80 guys hate to hear me say this, but I played on the 80 team. But as far as being an employee, that was one of the funnest clubs ever. They sent that locker room all night long. They told stories. Uh, there's something therapeutic to that. You know, when you, if you're depressed about something, what does a human being want you to do? They want you to listen. You know, they like to talk to people. They want to feel good. And, it, you know, I, and I believe that that era of baseball, when you said in the clubhouse, you don't always have to drain, but most guys did. But you sit there and you're talking about the game. If I got knocked out of the game and I went home, I'm going to make my wife hear this stuff. I mean, if I can leave it at the ballpark, that's pretty good. You know, I used to use ESPN to defuse myself. I'd watch other pitchers give up a bunch of runs, so I'm not the only one. But when you're in that ballpark and you're making that camaraderie with your players and you're putting your hand on them going, hey, Dickie, don't worry about it. We're behind you. You're going to get them the next time. There's something about, something about that is really neat. The player today deals with social media. The player today deals with his telephone all day long while he's in the locker room. Why is he on his telephone or his iPad? Well, he can talk to his wife. He can talk to his kids. You know, there's some good things about it, too, even though there's not a whole lot of good about it. But I think they do more of that. The player today makes tons of money. I remember one time Cliff Lee gave me his check. I don't know why he was getting his check for everybody has a direct positive. And he said, here, take it. I said, yeah, I'll take it. I opened it up. I went, dude, what's this for? Two weeks. You made more than me in 16 years. In two weeks, you made more than I did. It's kind of crazy. That's how it's not true. This two-week check was more of my 16-year career. So they make lots of money. There's different pressures on these players, but they're visual now. Everybody's looking. They want to see what Bryce Harper's doing. They want to see how he puts his shoes on. They want to see what shoes he puts on. They want to see how he combs his hair. And somebody's taking a picture. Somebody in that clubhouse from the outside, you have analytics in the clubhouse, you have mental skills in the clubhouse, you have tons of trainers in the clubhouse. You've got so many people in that clubhouse, it's not the private sanctuary you should be. So I think that that keeps players from doing that. Players don't want to be exposed. They want to get home and get out of there. Um, it's changed. It'd be nice if it was their clubhouse and they could sit around and say things and not worry about it being on social media or being printed or somebody judging them. The, the media is in there more than ever. Uh, it, it, it's insane. The media came at our clubhouse back in them days and they tiptoed around because they had to ride the same bus and the same planes that we did. So if they backstabbed you and took something out of there, they got to face you face to face. Media doesn't do that. It's all separate now. It's a whole new world in there. Hey, before you wrap things up, John, uh, Last chance to get round tickets? Yes. Get We're going to go see Sue over there. Raise your hand, Sue. She's there. She is. She there? She we see you, Sue. Sure All right, so last chance to get round tickets. We're going to be wrapping that up pretty soon. Yeah, make, sure, make sure you get your two free ones and your extras there for a dollar piece.
So uh, get in there. There's a lot of comic book prizes that we win and we get. Uh, so, uh, well, last thing. I'm Bill. He's John. But that's You're okay. Bill. I'm John. That's it. That's it. Did I call you John? No, you called him Bill. But that's okay. I know he's, he's John. He's been called lots of words. I'm 65. I get away with that. That's okay. That's okay. We just went through it. People go, we were okay. People call me Marty Bystrom, and I call him if you know sometimes. Uh, but, you know, another hour here to wrap up. <laughs> uh, another hour here to uh, wrap up. Thank you very much for coming out this evening. We appreciate it. Yeah, everybody, thanks. Thanks to Nikki Knowles for being here tonight. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, thanks to Nikki and uh, Eddie uh, here at the bar. Uh, and uh, make sure uh, you can come out uh, and mark it on your calendars for uh, November the 10th for Mitch Williams here. And um, next week we'll be in uh, Drexel Hill for uh, Brian Prop and uh, Hannah Hans Irish Club. Uh, so make sure you uh, mark that on your calendar as well. And then we'll be announcing on that Wednesday our, our surprise uh, guest, surprise guest for uh, that week. So uh, we are uh, wrapping up another hour. It went so quick. Uh, but uh, thanks for everybody uh, who is here uh, with us. And uh, we will see you next week. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody.